Bueno, campuseros, ya vamos a continuar. Tenemos con nosotros al fundador de Netflix. Démosle, por favor, un grandísimo aplauso a Mark Randolph. Thank you. I am really excited to be here. Got a lot of things I want to talk about. We're going to talk about ideas. We're going to talk about entrepreneurship. We'll talk about risk. We'll talk about Netflix. But first, actually, I want to share something. Yesterday, when I first walked into this hall, I was blown away. I mean, I was blown away by the scale of it, obviously. But the energy, that buzz, all the projects. But then a really cool thing happened. I remembered something that happened to me 35 years ago. And it made me realize just how special this moment is that I get to be sharing it with you. And it was so important to me that I thought about it all yesterday afternoon and all yesterday evening. And then I did the one thing you're never supposed to do before a presentation. I changed a slide. I put up this slide because 35 years ago, almost to the day, I was sitting right where you're sitting. I was a university student, just like most of you. It was in a conference center, almost exactly like this. It was a science fair. There were no hackathons then. We barely even had personal computers. But people were building things, and they were sharing ideas. We were showing each other what we had built. And like this, they had people on the stage who were presenting to us in the audience. And one of the people who presented was in advertising. And he showed us the work he was doing. He showed us a film of some of the TV commercials he had made. He showed some of the magazine advertisements he had done. He showed some billboards. And I sat right out there, and I was captivated that people using just words and design could cause emotion to happen. But then an even better thing happened. During the Q&A, someone said to him, what's the best thing about your job? And he thought for a minute, and he said, I get paid to come up with ideas. And then I get paid to turn those ideas into reality. And it was at that very moment, sitting pretty much exactly where you're sitting, 35 years ago, that I decided that's what I want to do with my life. And so there's a kind of uh, full circle happening here. That was the moment for me. And since that point, for the last 35 years, I've been incredibly lucky because I've spent those 35 years coming up with ideas. And even better, I've got to watch so many of those ideas turn into reality. And I got paid in many cases as well. So people, if they're familiar with me at all, it's as the guy who started that little thing called Netflix. But Netflix was actually my sixth startup. And since leaving Netflix almost 10 years ago, I've now worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs helping them turn their ideas into realities. So what's one thing I've learned in those 35 years from launching my own companies and helping and mentoring others? It's a simple thing, that anyone can do it. That you can do it. That you can do it. That you can do it. It's not that hard. I really believe anybody who wants to start something can do it. You don't need all kinds of special training. You don't need a business degree. You don't need an MBA. Incubators are nice, but they're not essential. Accelerators are the same thing. You don't need special courses. You don't need to go to a top school. Sure, some of the uh, entrepreneurs that I've helped have double masters in business and computer science from Stanford. But another one that I helped dropped out of Columbia as a sophomore, worked as a firefighter in Montana, 
drove an ambulance in Los Angeles, and then started his company. Another entrepreneur is only 17 years old. Another entrepreneur played in a ska band for 10 years. He has dreadlocks down to here. And I just heard from him last week that he sold his latest company for $10 million. In fact, you don't even need to be a particularly great student. I've found that the best entrepreneurs are not the A students. It's the B students, or even the C students. What you do need, however, is two things. The first one is, you've got to be prepared for risk. You've got to have a tolerance for risk. Risk is fundamental to everything we do when we start things up. 99 out of 100 ideas are probably going to fail, but you never know which one will succeed until you try. You've got to risk it. You've got to put yourself out there. I think as a culture, we've started to really push risk out of our lives. It's a shame. I was talking before about the A students and B students. The top students have been trained for year after year to not take any risks, to only take a course they're almost guaranteed to do well in, not to write a difficult paper, not to take a hard subject. You need to have risk. And the second thing, of course, and the second thing, of course, is you've got to have an idea. An idea is the same thing. It's not that hard. People spend too much time looking for the perfect idea. You don't need to you know, cure, cure world hunger your first time out. You need to try something. Doesn't need to be a big idea. Mark Zuckerberg famously started Facebook just to meet girls. And Reed Hastings and I started Netflix for no other reason just to make it easier to rent movies. My son started his first company when he was eight years old. When he realized that he could buy a candy bar for 25 cents at the grocery store and sell it the next day for a dollar at school. And in fact, I've had people come up to me afterwards and say, I did that. I used to sell candy at school. But I now kind of believe that candy arbitrage is some kind of genetic marker for entrepreneurism. Doesn't need to be an original idea. People were selling books for hundreds of years before Jeff Bezos came up with Amazon. People were renting cars since pretty much right after the wheel came out. But there was still room for Uber and Lyft, relay rides, get around, and all the other innovations in transportation. And most importantly, it doesn't need to be a complex idea. This is one of my favorite ideas of all time, the forever stamp. It solved huge problems for American consumers, huge problems for the US Post Office. It's the size of my thumb, and it's made out of paper. No technology involved. In fact, I really believe it doesn't even need to be a good idea. Because after all, what is a good idea? When I told my wife I wanted to start a company, and we were going to mail DVDs back and forth in the mail, she thought that was the stupidest idea she had ever heard. And I imagine all of you have had the same experience, where you tell your friends or your family about this great idea you've had and what do they say? That'll never work. You just have to get out and try something. You never know a good idea from a bad idea. Nobody does. And there's a simple reason for it. And the person I'm going to call on to explain that is a gentleman named William Goldman. Does anybody have any clue who William Goldman is? Well, I'm not surprised. William Goldman is a Hollywood guy. He's a writer, and if you don't know his name, you might know his work. Who here has seen Princess Bride? A few people. He wrote Princess Bride. He wrote All the President's Men. He wrote Misery, General's Daughter, um, 20 other movies. He's won two Academy Awards. But that's not the important piece. What William Goldman is most famous for is for writing three words. What William Goldman wrote was, 
Nobody knows anything. Nobody knows anything. He was referring, of course, to Hollywood and to the fact that no one has any idea how well a movie's going to do until after it's been released. That you can have the best stars, the A-list director, a perfect screenplay, and end up with a movie like um, Heaven's Gate, which costs almost $50 million to make and made about $3 million at the box office. And at the same time, have complete unknowns make a movie like The Blair Witch Project, which completed its photography for about $35,000 and has since grossed nearly $250 million. Nobody knows anything. True in Hollywood, true in Silicon Valley, and I'd say true just about any place people are trying to come up with new businesses. I mentioned before that Netflix was my sixth startup, but if you had asked me beforehand, which of those six will be the big hits? Which will be the big losers? I never could have told you. Because nobody knows anything. And since leaving Netflix, I've done a little bit of angel investing. So I'm really aware of that rule of thumb which says, for every 10 investments I make, I'm going to lose all my money on seven of them. Maybe I'll break even on two. And if I'm really lucky, one of my investments will pay off the other nine. But which, which is going to be the winner? Nobody knows anything. So if you don't know what's going to be the winner, what do you have to do? You have to take that risk and do something. Now, I don't mean to be trite by saying that. I mean, how many times have we all heard, it's easy, just do it, just try it. But no one really talks about how do you take that first step? How do I do it? How do I get the courage to push off and start? Well, it all starts with an idea. So let's talk for a minute about where do ideas come from? Now, here at a tech conference, you guys are pretty fluent about these things. And obviously, there's lots of places where, techs come, where ideas can come from. One, of course, is looking at new technologies. Things like big data, mobile, that sort of thing. Then, of course, you can look at current trends. We can also look at new business models, two-sided markets, crowdsourcing, etc. But the single best place to look for ideas is very, very easy for all of us to do. All you really have to do is look for pain. And I actually have an even simpler way to remember this. All you have to ask yourself is, what sucks? What sucks? What is terrible? What's not working? What's broken? And that is not that hard to find, especially if you start with things that you know well. So if you've got a hobby, start there. Let's say you do uh, drones, make drones for yourself. It's not so hard to say, what's broken about this? What's not working? What can I make better? If you're a university student, look at, things that, look at the problems that a university student would face. Things like, is there a good party going on here? Where do I get my textbook from? Is this class any good? Does that girl on the corner of the class like me? Or you can start with jobs, summer jobs, full-time jobs, places you've bumped into problems. Just to give you an example, what I'm going to do now is talk about one of my jobs that I did when I was just about your age. And we'll see how bad that is and how many problems there are, and we'll see how many ideas we can come up with. So my summer job was I was a house painter. I painted houses. That was 35 years ago. And back then, when you went to buy paint, it came in a container like this one. Now, about three weeks ago, I had some more painting to do. I was painting my daughter's bedroom. And I went to buy paint, and the container looked like this again. So here you have a container virtually unchanged in 35 years. Now, is that because they have perfected the paint can? Absolutely not. This is the definition of suck. 
It is the worst possible design for storing and using paint. And I'm astounded it's still being used. So let's talk for a minute about what sucks so much about paint. To start, to open a can of paint, you have to go get a tool. You have to get a screwdriver. I can think of no other things when I need to open them. I have to go find a screwdriver. So now you have a top covered with paint. You've got to put it someplace where you won't step in it. That's the first problem. Now you've got to stir it. They don't provide any kind of self-stirring mechanism, so they give you a stick. And you stir the paint, and now you have a stick covered with paint. So you have to begin trying to wipe it off inside the can, which takes seven or eight iterative steps, and still there's paint on the stick. So you put that down and hope you don't step in it. Now you've got to pour the paint. And it's not designed to pour, there's no spout. So you try pouring the paint, and that works. But then when you stand it back up, you notice two things. One is it's all spilled down the side. So when you put it down, it's going to make a big mark on the floor. The other problem is it's filled up this little rim around the outside of the can. So more about that later. Now you paint, and that's definitely a problem. You have rollers, you have tape. It makes a mess. Cleanup's difficult. Then it comes time to close the can back up. So it seems appropriate that you needed a screwdriver to open it. Now you're going to need a hammer to close it. So you put the lid back on and you hammer it shut. But what happened with all that paint that had filled up that little rim around? Of course, it sprays all over the, uh, the room. So this is an awful, awful system. And it sucked 35 years ago, and it sucks today. And there's got to be products here. And when I've done this exercise with some other people, other, with smaller groups, they immediately come up with ideas. Extra lids which get put on afterwards, which have a spout on them. Or something you drive through the top to make a self-sealing spout. Or something that goes around the rim. Or different designs for the can altogether. Idea after idea after idea after idea. And that's after a three-minute exercise. But if you can train yourself to see the pain in the world, you'll find millions upon millions of ideas out there all waiting for you to solve. Contrary to popular belief, ideas rarely spring from some eureka moment. Netflix, for example, did not come from some momentary anguish over a late fee on a movie. We were very much looking for that idea. That idea was buried in a big pile of bad ideas. And we didn't find the idea for Netflix in a video store. We found it while carpooling. So to explain how we found an idea for a movie streaming site while carpooling, I have to give you some background. About three years before Netflix came along, maybe a little less, a couple years before, I was working for a very small startup. There was nine of us. It was doing a technical product. It was called Integrity QA. And as things happened in Silicon Valley, we were acquired by a larger, even more geeky software company. I and my eight co-founders immediately joined the company. And I find myself working side by side with the founder of that company, who happened to be a gentleman named Reed Hastings. We went along quite well for six or nine months until this company was acquired by an even larger and even geekier software company. And then the best Silicon Valley thing happened. I was fired. But I was fired in the good way, the Silicon Valley way, where they say, Mark, you're not going to have a job, but we need you to stick around. Maybe just six months, but we'll pay you. You can keep your office, you can keep your fast internet connection, your whiteboard, your telephone, your conference table, and you don't need to do anything. Now, faced with that, I did the only thing reasonable. I said, okay, it's time to start another company. Now, Reed Hastings, he was also fired. But rather than start a company, his idea was to go off and be an educational, educational philanthropist. That was his passion. But he wanted to keep a finger in the pie. So he said, 
I'll tell you what. If you come up with a good idea, I'll fund it. And that way I can stay involved. So then began the search for an idea. And it worked like this. Every morning, Reed would leave his house in Santa Cruz, where we both lived, and pick me up. And then as we drove the approximately 45 minutes to an hour to our office, we'd talk about ideas. We'd brainstorm some possible things that might make good businesses. And I'd gather up a big collection of these ideas. I would go into my little office with my whiteboard and my fast internet connection and my telephone, my conference table, and I'd work on these ideas. And at the end of the day, we'd get in Reed's car and we'd drive back to Santa Cruz and I'd tell him what I had discovered. And we went over that for week after week after week. And there's an important thing you have to know about ideas, which is that ideas have a half-life. In fact, the half-life of an idea is 24 hours. So what do I mean by the half-life of an idea is 24 hours? It means that if I start off on Monday with 16 bright, shiny, new ideas, that 24 hours later, by Tuesday, I've probably found big holes in eight of them. So I've got eight left. Now I keep researching, and by Wednesday, I'm down to four. Then Thursday, I'm down to two. And Friday, if I'm very lucky, I'll have one good idea left. Once you have that good idea, you move into a separate phase. And for us, when we were working on all these ideas, one of them was a great one. It was, let's rent video by mail. But at the time, video came, and you may remember this, on a large video cassette. It was heavy, it was expensive, and so renting video by mail was one of the ideas that was thrown into the trash. But then about two weeks later, coincidentally, we read about a brand new technology called DVD. And that, we realized, might change a few things. What if we could take the DVD and mail it to customers? So then, instead of Reed and I driving to work one day, we got in the car, turned around, drove down into the town of Santa Cruz, went to a record store and bought a music CD, because DVD wasn't even available. Went next door to the stationery store and bought one of those little envelopes that you put gift cards in. Took the CD, put it in the envelope, addressed it to Reed, put a stamp on it, and walked up the steps and dropped it in the mail at the Santa Cruz post office. 24 hours later, the next morning, Reed pulled up to pick me up and he didn't say anything. He just held up the envelope. And that was the moment we realized this crazy idea just might work. Once you have an idea which seems promising, it kind of moves into a totally different phase. And this is where, instead of rejecting them, you're trying to understand them. What's it going to cost to build the website? How much do DVDs cost? How many titles are there? How long will this take us? How will we price this? Question after question after question. And I was spending every day working through these questions, trying to understand, will this idea really work? The problem is, even after weeks and weeks and weeks of research, I'd gotten to a point where I couldn't learn anymore, and I still didn't know if it was going to work. Unfortunately, there's no one you can ask or point to, or look at, and say, oh, they're doing it. And so, we were in that position that every entrepreneur finds themselves in, where they have to make a decision, and they have to make that decision based on incomplete, inconclusive, or contradictory information. And when you're faced with that, there is a Silicon Valley term for what you have to do next. You just have to do it.
and we did. At that point, we took the plunge. We invested about $2 million, hired some people, got a small office, began working, and nine months later, in April of 1997, we launched the Netflix website. Now, the Netflix that you know now bears very little resemblance to the Netflix then. To start, there was no streaming. The only way to get a DVD was to have it mailed to you. Get a movie was on DVD and have it mailed to you. And we had due dates. We had late fees. We rented movies, but we also sold movies. So totally different than it is now. The rental and sales were very, very different businesses. The problem is, sales was doing well. It was doing very well. In fact, by the end of that first summer, for every one DVD we rented, we sold several hundred. 99% of our revenue came from selling DVDs. Now, you heard me say, this is a bad thing. And it's a bad thing because we looked out into the future and saw that pretty soon Amazon would begin selling DVDs. And then so would Walmart. And then so would Costco. And then soon everybody would be selling DVDs and our margins would be driven down to zero and we'd be out of business. Now, rent, on the other hand, that was a good business, very highly differentiated, re decent margins. The problem is no customers wanted to do it. So we had a great DVD for sale business that was going to be phenomenal until all of a sudden it wasn't and a DVD rental business that was doing nothing. And worse, it was extremely difficult to do both of them at the same time. Some of the movies we rented couldn't be sold. Some that we sold couldn't be rented. Some could be both. The homepage had to describe that we did two different things. Our checkout process confused people because it had to adopt to renting and selling. Advertising was complicated. What kind of a company are we? So we decided we had a focus. We had to pick one of these business and bet everything on that one business. And as a young CEO, I struggled for a long time trying to decide which of these two businesses do I focus on. And I went for advice to a person I really consider my personal hero. And it's a person that I actually think is the greatest leader that's ever been. It's a gentleman named Ernest Shackleton. So, if you don't know Ernest Shackleton, he's a polar explorer. And Shackleton decided in the, day, in the years leading up to World War I that he would be the first expedition to cross the Antarctic continent from one side to the other. His plan was to commission a wooden sailing ship called the Endurance, sail this to Antarctica, disembark, and move all the way across Antarctica to the other side. Now, this being polar exploration, things didn't quite work out like he planned. The Endurance was stuck in the ice, and as the Antarctic winter set in, the Endurance was slowly but surely crushed and sank. Things happened slowly, so Shackleton had plenty of time to unload the ship. And so pictures, photo photographs taken of the time, things looked actually pretty comfy. The men had wooden huts built on the ice, they had fires, they had food, they were having dog sled races, they were playing football. It was a pretty comfortable existence on this multi-mile ice floe. But Shackleton recognized that as the Antarctic summer approached, his comfortable ice floe was going to begin getting smaller and smaller and smaller until him and his whole expedition got dumped into the sea. And so he had to make a tough decision. 
Do I stay with my comfortable life until it's not so comfortable anymore? Or do I do something tremendously risky? Do I pile men into open boats and use this to try and reach safety? Well, Shackleton made the tough call. He piled his whole expedition into these small boats and they set off into the sea on what actually is one of the most remarkable stories of um, survival that I've ever read. But the message for me was clear. We could stay with sails, we could stay on our comfortable ice flow, or we could bet it all on a fledgling rental which was extremely uncertain. And so we did like Shackleton. We left sails behind and bet everything on rental. Now, when you walk away from 99% of your revenue, it has a way of focusing the mind. We were now desperate to make rental work. We were desperate about making rental work. And we tried everything. We tried rent 10 and get one free. We tried punch cards. We tried bundling. I could make a list a hundred lines long of all the things we tried during that period. And we never found something that really worked. But we learned something even more important and more interesting. We learned that the faster we went, the more we learned. And the quicker we got a feature out, the sooner we'd figure out whether it was a good feature or a bad feature. That the cycle time was what was crucial. That customers always surprised us. That if we took a bad idea and fixed it and polished it and added features to it, in the end, it was still a bad idea. But if we had a good idea, no matter how terrible it was, no matter how poorly finished it was, it would still work. And then we'd immediately know, now we know what to polish. So during this period of fast iteration, we learned something crucial. We learned that it's not about finding good ideas. It's about a system to try lots of bad ideas. So if you're an entrepreneur and you have an idea, in my opinion, the biggest mistake you can make is spend all your time fixing it, building it out, getting the design just perfect. It doesn't make a difference. You don't want to be good. You don't want to build something that's going to make your one idea great. You want to be great at trying lots of bad ideas. Now, that's really what a startup is all about. It's a group formed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. And you do that by rapidly, rapidly, rapidly trying as many ideas as you can until you get to something that works. And now I'm quite serious. I'm going to pass on the, probably the most important thing I've learned in my career as an entrepreneur. And it's two words. Fake it. The mistake we made at Netflix, if there was one, was we were doing it for real. Each time we had an idea, we thought we really had to build that feature and roll it out. But it's not true. Sometimes your question doesn't require you to build the product to answer the question. You can fake it. You can figure out some way to do it, without real, to find it out without really doing it. You've certainly all heard the concept of the minimal viable product. And that's basically where you take a product and strip it down to its essence, the smallest product you can come up with to test your hypothesis and then put that out there. But I actually believe that if you're building a minimal viable product, you're building too much. You don't even need to build the product. I call this validation hacking. It's cl being clever about figuring out ways to test your idea without actually building it. So, 
I know that's a confusing concept, so let me give you three examples. The first isn't even a tech product. This was one of my first startups, and it was a magazine. I, I assume you're all familiar with what a magazine is. That's kind of an old, never mind. Um, the idea that we had in starting the magazine was that there should be room for a Macintosh-specific magazine. And we had about 10 to 12 ideas of how to position this. Who should it focus on? Should it be graphics heavy or should it be writing heavy? Should there be examples? Should it include a DVD? All ideas that needed to be tested. The problem is, testing with a real magazine is very expensive. You've got to write it, do the photography, print it, mail it, and only then do you see if it works or doesn't work. So what we did was rather than printing magazines, we took our 10 best ideas, and all we did was create the mailing piece that went with each of those ideas. They were mailing pieces that pretended this magazine actually existed. It described the features, it had a picture, but it wasn't the real thing. We mailed out the 10 mailings. One of them did better than the other. That's the magazine we made. And that's the magazine that became Mac user. The other nine, we sent everyone their money back with an apology. And we had learned how to test the idea of a magazine without actually creating the magazine. Let me give you a more tech example. This is a young entrepreneur that I work with. The problem that he found, the thing that he said sucked, was when he was at a party at night and they ran out of beer. And everybody would argue, it's your turn to get the beer. Or, I got it last time, I don't want to do it. So what he said is, I've got a faster way to do that. How about if you have an app and all you have to do is hit the button, it knows where you are, and someone delivers the beer. Well, as he was saying, what's really the question here? It wasn't, can I build an app? He knew he could do that. He knew he could get beer at a store. He knew he could deliver it. The question is, would consumers want it? So the way he hacked that was he printed up paper business cards that said, need more beer? Call me. And he stood in front of an apartment building at 8 o'clock on a Friday night and handed one out to everybody going in. And people called him. And he learned a ton. He learned the average order size. He learned the repeat rate. He also learned it didn't work, but that he did learn things from that experiment that told him what to try next. And he repeated and repeated and repeated all on paper until he had figured out the right spot. And only then did he raise money and build the app. One more example. This one's called Q Doctor. He noticed that popular doctors had three and four week waits to get an appointment. At the same time, the doctors would complain about cancellations. He thought, wouldn't it be great if there was software on the desk of the receptionist that allowed him to notify someone if there's a missed appointment and people could have their cell phones and get notified there's an opening, do you want it? Almost like Uber. He didn't build the app, he knew he could build an app. He knew he could build a desktop application. He wasn't sure would this work. So he used a pad and a pen, and he sat right next to the receptionist, and every time someone called for an appointment, he'd take the phone and say, do you want to be notified if something opens up? And when something opened up, he'd take the phone again, and he'd call them. And he realized this does work. They were filling 90% of their appointments. And based on that, raised the money, built the app. Validation hacking. Figuring out a clever idea to test your premise that can be done without having to actually build your application, do your technology, or spend your money. Netflix is no different. After our hundreds and hundreds of iterations, we finally came up with the three ideas that seemed to work. They were to let customers keep the disk at their house. There was no due dates. We let them build a list of movies they wanted to receive, so we didn't need to ask them what they wanted each time they returned something. And we made it subscription. It seems simple, but those three ideas required cycling through 300 bad ones. 
And amazingly enough, when we combined the three, it worked. We had found our product market fit. And that was the point that Netflix changed from a startup to a company. And we began to scale and build. And eventually, you know the rest of the story. I want to tell you one last story here. Um, I mentioned briefly that we had spent those nine months building the Netflix website and then launching Netflix. Launch day was on April 14, 1997. I can remember it so distinctly. We were in a two-room office. There was 14 of us. We were set to go live at 9 o'clock a.m. We had rigged it up so a bell would ring every time an order came in. And then we all placed bets on how many orders we'd get the first day. And I think it went from 20 was being the low bet, maybe 50 or 60 was the high bet. And then 9 o'clock came, we hit the button, and nothing happened. And then about three or four minutes later, ding! And we all cheered, the first order. And then a minute later, ding, ding, ding! Three more, we all cheered. And then a two minutes later, ding, ding! And then silence because the servers had crashed. And so, rather than me spending the first day of Netflix existence walking with a glass of champagne, I was in an electronic superstore pushing a shopping cart while my CTO was throwing computer components in so we could go and rebuild our servers that night. So, that first day ended, and the winning was... Uh, a hundred orders. And that was an amazing thing for us. But three years later, we had 500,000 subscribers. And now, we've got about 45 million subscribers. And when I started earlier today and I said that I was sitting out there 35 years ago, never in a million years could I have dreamed a company like this would have come from something that I did. In fact, if you had asked me in 1997, I never would have believed Netflix would enjoy the success it has today. So, people often say to me, you must, in fact, they asked it today, you must be proud. You're so proud of this big company, but I'm really not sure how to answer. What am I proud of? Was I smart? Well, no. As I've explained a couple of times, 99 out of 100 ideas were bad ones. I definitely wasn't smart. Well, maybe something else. Was I persistent? Absolutely. I was a bulldog. It was almost nothing that would set me back. And if we had more time, I could tell you stories about some of the difficulties we faced from that point forward that almost make me want to give up. But the person who I think says it best is another Hollywood name, this time Mary Pickford. Now, Mary Pickford was a movie star who in 1909 sir, uh, appeared in almost 50 movies in one year. And Mary Pickford was known as America's sweetheart, even though she was from Canada. But the reason I'm introducing you to Mary Pickford is because what Mary Pickford said is this thing we call failure is not the falling down, but the staying down. And even though I was knocked down, I was hard to keep down. But I think the thing that I'm most proud of is neither of these things. It's my optimism. I am an optimist. And I'm not a glass half full optimist. I'm a glass running over optimist. I'm like one of those things at the wedding with champagne on the floor optimist. I mentioned earlier that I had a brief career as an angel investor, and I'm a terrible angel investor. And I'm a terrible angel investor because I like every idea that I hear. And I've seen enough. I'll be sitting in my chair, listening, and part of me is saying, this is bad. These guys aren't going to make it. 
but I can't help myself. I lean forward and I think, and before I know it, I'm at the whiteboard helping them figure out, going, we can do this. I think we can still make it work. Optimism. So when I said earlier that you only need two things, I'm afraid I wasn't telling you the truth. There's a third thing you need. The third thing you need, and it's a simple one, you've got a you, tolerance for risk, obviously. You need an idea, but you've got to believe in yourself. Starting something is hard. Starting something is lonely. Starting something is scary. But you can do it. You just got to have confidence. When your friends tell you that will never work, well, most of the time they're going to be right but not always. So you got to give it a go. you got to believe you can actually do it. So I think I'm going to close by quoting from someone who I think actually is fairly appropriate for this audience, Nolan Bushnell. Yeah. And Nolan Bushnell, as I hope you all know, is really the father of the gaming industry. He was the founder of Atari. But the reason I have him up here is because of something he said. He said, everyone who has ever taken a shower has had an idea. It's the person who gets out of the shower, dries off, and does something about it that makes the difference. So you guys are winding up an incredible week here. And I please ask you, don't consider this the end of something. This should be the beginning of something. I'm really counting on all you guys to take your ideas and get out of the shower and towel off and do something and make a difference. And I'll be rooting for you. Thank you very much for your time. I really Are there questions? Head? Head? Um, you saw this question? Um, hi. Thanks for coming to Mexico. Um, how can you hack the validation of a software? You know, because that three examples you gave, any of those was a software, right? when you did the validation. What I mean, can you do something pretty basic and count as hacking validation? You know, like a beta? Yes, uh, and certainly you want to make it as simple as you can. And I would agree, sometimes there are absolutely ideas that require some level of building to test them. But I would challenge you that I'll bet Almost anything you think of, you could figure out some way to test whether your hypothesis is correct. I mean, um, there are tools, for example, if you want to know how someone behaves in a web environment, there's tools to hack together a simple web page. And that's not paper, but it's certainly not coding either. It doesn't need to work. It just needs to prove the behavior you're expecting actually happens. Yes. Hello, thank you. Uh, well, what I want to ask you is what kind of challenges have you have faced? And why Netflix USA and Netflix here in Mexico, it's a little bit different? Uh, the challenge is a long question. Um, USA, uh, Mexico, USA, Netflix. Uh, first of all, I will say I no longer work at Netflix. And so I don't want to speak for them but I happen to know the answer to that one. One of the reasons that streaming took so long to come, not just in Mexico, but in the United States, was not because there was no technical solution. Years before it came out, we knew how to stream, we knew how to do the security. The problem is that the, the studios have very, very different systems for how they make content available. 
And quite frankly, at the very beginning, they had no interest in participating in a little teeny streaming business. What you're seeing is the remnants of some of that today. Whereas the rights for certain movies in Mexico are very different than the rights for certain movies in the United States. And it does work for you sometimes. Some titles are available here that aren't available there. But that's the main difference. And challenges. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of a particular one that was particularly naughty. Um, one of the problems was the challenge of every single, of us knowing at the beginning that streaming was going to come, but not knowing when. Literally from day one, we shipped our very first DVD, we knew that eventually everybody would be receiving their movies over a wire or through the air as bits, not plastic. The problem is nobody could tell you when. And even worse, when they guessed, they guessed way too soon. But Reed and I actually thought it would take a long time for this to develop. So the trick is, how do you make a company successful in one thing when ultimately it needs to be something different? And that was a huge challenge. And I think we actually came up with a great solution, which is we never called the company a great way to rent a movie. We said it was a great place to find something you like because that works either way. It's a great place to find a movie you like when you get it on DVD. It's a great place to find a movie you like when it comes over a wire. We're neutral. And that way we began investing in that. We began doing all the personalization software, all these things to make us stand for that so we could change very easily when the time was right. And that's turned out to be a, a good bet. <laughs> uh, this question. Uh, from all the startups that, that you started in the past, um, uh, other than Netflix, um, other startups that you, you think that you, they ha had gained uh, a lot of, of success? I, I can't hear very well. Okay. I can't hear. Yeah. Other startups that you have started in the past? Other startups that, that you have started in the past that you feel that they have gained a lot of success? Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Okay. Anyone else hear it? Over here, please. Yeah. Uh, to your left. Hi, Paul. I'll talk to you later. I'll ask her later if you'd like. Sorry. Yep. Uh, yeah, over here? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, to your left. Here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks for your speech. It was very inspiring. And my question is, how do you realize that you are working with the right people? And how do you keep them motivated if there is no money uh, immediately? That's, that's an incredibly important thing for someone who's a CEO to do, is keep people inspired. But we actually found something very, very interesting at Netflix, which is actually not very common. We set up a system that was designed to reward people who are the very best workers. And what we found out is what they want is to be surrounded by other great people. And now that sounds like a simple thing to say. It's a very, very hard thing to do. Because you can say, oh, we only want A players. But the reality is you're going to end up with B players and C players. And it requires the discipline to say, <laughs> to say thank you very much to some people, even if they've been with you for a while. Um, and I think but what happens is when there's people who are surrounded by brilliant people, I don't mean smart, but hardworking, competent, can do what they're asked, it makes it better for everybody and it really cements this thing as a place that I want to work. But I spent so much of my time doing that. Oh, here's a story. Okay. Um, You know, of course, about stock options. And there are a promise that stock might be worth something in the future. And I would go to people and say, this stock is going to be worth $100. 
And they'd go, kind of look at me funny. And then afterwards, someone I worked with would take me aside and said, don't you feel bad kind of bullshitting that person like that? And I would say, I don't think it's bullshitting if I believe it. And I had such confidence in the company that that becomes infectious. People want to do something they believe in. And that's a very powerful tool. Hi. Uh, so what, what had to happen in Netflix? So you decide to make that amazing change? Why did, I, why did I decide to leave Netflix? Was that what you said? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and also, another question, and how Netflix decided to make that change to the streaming service? Ah. How did we make the decision to change from disks to streaming? Yeah. 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 So that it wasn't, it, it was known that all along we were going to be doing this. And so all along we were working on the technology to do it. We had to wait for the time to be right. And so there was actually quite a few of these little tests I keep describing to see if you go out to customers, how many of them might take it. And what happens is early, nobody wants it. They don't have fast enough connection. They're not comfortable. There's not enough titles. But you keep asking. And at some point, you recognize this actually is large enough now that we think people are willing to take this and pay for it. We also started out as having them bundled. Get the discs and you get the streaming, no change in the price as a way of getting it going. Sure. Ah. Hi, Mark. My name is Gustavo. Um, I just have a question here in Mexico. There is a proposal of law. It's called the telecommunications reform. And one of, uh, one of the things in this uh, proposal is uh, consumers have to pay a fee for VIP services, for example, for Netflix. And um, I, I think this, this is because companies doesn't have the enough infrastructure. And I don't know, I just want to know your opinion of, on here by Netflix. Thank you. Uh, the quick answer is that I'm not very well informed. Again, I haven't been at Netflix for a while, and I know they're struggling very much with net, with net neutrality and tolls on the internet. I, conceptually, my feeling is that net neutrality, everyone paying the same, is an important concept. I'm very scared about having some larger companies, and I'll put even Netflix in that same category, having a different level of service than a company that can't afford to pay. And I think that what that does is stifle innovation. It means that the winner is the person who has more money rather than the person with a be better idea. And that's definitely not something that I want to see. Hi there. Now that you came up with this great Netflix idea, how do you do to keep generating ideas? I mean, what is your method to innovate your, your ideas all the time? One of the best things about having lots of ideas, well, I've, I told you some techniques for yourself. But for a company, one of the things is that every time you test some, you have an idea and you test it, you're very careful about measuring it. And you have to set your tests up carefully. You can't just take an idea and put it out by itself. You have to compare it to something else. But what that does is it creates a culture of decisions being made by the data, that the numbers make the decision. And when that happens, it means that my idea is no better than your idea. You can have the president of the company and the person who works in the warehouse, and their ideas are equal because the ultimate decision is which one worked. And that culture encourages people to try. It's a, and it's a very powerful way to do that. And you'll see lots of things come out when you make it easy for people to do it. We also... Chavos, 
Antes, hay que darle un fuerte aplauso a Mark Randolph. Vamos a proceder a que Mark Randolph nos firme la, la bata que es para el premio del Iron Geek. Eh, ahorita todavía están las imágenes que estuvo durante todo el tiempo para preguntas y respuestas, para que si tienen chance le tomen eh, la foto, pues. Pero vamos a proceder a que nos la firmen. The official signing. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. Got this. Yep. 